All right, we're going to continue with digital painting. If you go to unit modules, I just introduced this quickly at the end of last class. We are in unit 14. In many ways, this is my favorite module because it gives you the most kind of creative freedom to just to just create something like just out of raster pixels. That's why the little uh, icon here is actually an animation I made of this glittering diamond. It's my favorite one. Anyway, the first part of this unit is answering question of the day four. And so that's why the due, due date for it is today. I'd like everyone to look at it and maybe try to fully answer it by today. You'll have another chance to turn it in in our last week of classes. But what sort of difficulties does digital art com commonly run into about its value and validity that traditional art media doesn't usually have to deal with? So I work as a traditional artist. I work as a commercial artist. I work as a digital artist, right? When I do traditional art shows, some of my galleries will not show my digital art, right? So they'll show photographs that I've made. They'll show paintings. They'll show sculptures. They'll show prints I've made in things like lithography or silkscreen or etchings. But they will not show digital inkjet prints or digital work because of this problem it has with validity. Why is that? Well, because digital data, right? whether it's a digital painting or a composite or a vector, whatever, can be perfectly copied. And if something can be perfectly copied, there can be an infinite number of them. And value, especially monetary value, the things that an art gallery is interested in as it relates to, to art or imagery, is based on scarcity. So if you can have, no matter how complicated that digital image is, if you can have an infinite number of them, it's really hard to give it the same sort of value that you can give to a, a charcoal drawing on the back of a business card, because that thing only exists in one iteration. This is infinitely compounded now, because now digital art isn't easily recognizable as done by a person. Because we have AI, what we call AI, but it's really synthetic media. It's, it's generative uh, programming that creates pixel-based images. So for instance, scroll to the end here, all of these golden owls with red mechanical eyes, they were just made using a stable diffusion image generator where I put in that prompt. And this raccoon is created with Dolly 2, though it looks like it's digitally painted. And so it's tough because at the end of the day, it's still this data, it's still just pixels. We don't know if a computer made it. We don't know if a human being made it. And so how can we understand these things? How can we deal with them? Not only that they're easy to steal, but it's hard to authenticate who even made them, right? So if I make these golden owls, I say I make them, but I just put in the prompt in a program and the way the law is at least right now is that no one made these you know the person that made these is not a person it's a computer and it's not owned by the computer and it's not owned by the the people that made the software on the computer and it's not owned by the person that put the prompt in it's kind of considered an act of god it's like if you saw a golden owl with red mechanical eyes made by clouds in the sky right no one owns that but what you could do is capture an image of it and then base your artwork on it, manipulate it, transform it like you would with any other found pixel image. And that's allowed. So that's something to think of. When we're trying to understand this AI, it's really complicated to understand. So before we had digital art, you had artists already taking images from other media, like Andy Warfall, for instance, taking the obituary photo from a New York newspaper of uh, the day after Marilyn Monroe died, taking that photo from the newspaper, turning it into a larger silkscreen image, just a photographic process, and then choosing different colored inks to fill in that image and creating his own artwork, right? So that's called appropriation, taking from pre-existing images, making it your own. Nowadays, this is from 2014, it was for um, a post office sponsored contest for a Marilyn Monroe stamp you have all of these different versions of doing the same thing Warhol did, but now they're doing it digitally. They're taking photos of Marilyn Monroe, 
and then they are making their own versions of them digitally. Move forward a few more years to about 2018, and you start to have programs making original faces out of a data set of around a thousand faces. So we use Portrait AI app way back in the beginning of the semester when we were making avatars. And that was one option we had. What, how Portrait AI app works is it takes, just like this program, and you can read, look at this video for some information. So it takes an image that you give it, in this case, a selfie I put in of myself, right? And then it has a data set of a thousand different portraits from the 18th and 19th century. And then it uses the same kind of feature recognition algorithm to composite an image based on its data set that's similar to the proportions of the image you gave it. So this reveals the problems with this generative technology. I have glasses. The first iteration was that. The second iteration was that. The third iteration was that. The fourth iteration was that, right? Even by the first iteration, you can see a fault in this limited data set and that these thousand portraits, they're not wearing glasses, not because glasses weren't invented, but because if you were going to sit for a portrait in the 18th or 19th century, you would take your glasses off because you didn't want those immortalized in a very expensive painting. So first thing, it removes my glasses. If I take that image and then generate based on that, now it's going to make everything a little bit more generic, right? And if I do a version based on that, eventually it's going to turn into a flawless white woman. Because data sets are limited by what their parameters are. And if most of those 18th and 19th century portraits are Caucasian portraits of women, it's going to turn everyone into a white woman. And I tested it out in four steps. Right. So if you take what it gives you and then you put that back into the system, reiterating. So on these three portraits, you have different it's, it's going to regress towards a flawless white woman in four steps. So those are the flawless white women. In the same way, whenever we have uh, image generation based on a data set, even if it's stable diffusion, which is the next big innovation happened around 2021, it's always going to reveal the limitations of that data set. In the case of using the whole internet as a data set, of imagery, all the biases, all of the, the weird issues that exist in humankind will exist in your imagery. So if you look for a nurse, it's always going to give you a female nurse, right? That kind of thing. If you look for a samurai, it's always going to be an Asian samurai, even though I don't know how many types of samurai there are <laughs> in reality running around today. So this is revealed a lot with this article. I link if you want to do a deep dive into this, because this is all the burgeoning science and digital art and computing. Why does AI art struggle with hands? And the newest versions have largely created models precisely for this problem in hands, so they don't mess up as much. But it's because when you look up a random image that has hands in it, you're seeing that hands from lots of different angles. Sometimes it's overlapped with other hands. Sometimes it's just from the side and only looks like you can see two fingers. And that's because computers have no experience in the real world, right? They're not thinking of these things as 3D objects seen from certain points of view. They're just seeing them as a flat grid of pixels. So this is one of the earliest models of what's called uh, stable diffusion prompt-based image generation. And I don't even think it's supported anymore, but I'm going to put in a prompt that's going to help with my... my digital painting project. So flying feathered serpent bird in the style of, who's a painter you guys like? Dolly, Salvador Dolly. Okay, I'm going to copy that because I'm going to use that in a, in a program that is more current. But this was the first generation. And I like to show it because it actually runs by taking a random pixel diffusion and then just like chat gpt it picks a pixel and then it picks the next pixel and then the next pixel and then the next pixel all super fast until it gives you what it thinks you want 
So this is the really basic, you can actually download all of the, the code for this. This was the first thing, and it's not great. But what's cool about this is unlike those portrait ones that we used earlier in the semester, I don't even know if it can show it to me at resolution, these are not composites from existing images. Right? Just like ChatGPT isn't just stealing from different websites and then copying and pasting it into a new text. This is actually creating new pixels based on a probability model to match what you want based on all the stuff it can find online. Right? No one owns it, but I can use it. Now, the one I actually like to use So according to current law, no, no one owns it. It's an act of God, just like shaped clouds in the sky, right? But that doesn't even mean it's the same as public domain, because as an act of God, I can't claim ownership to it. But if I modify it, then I could. If I transform it, if I use it, if it inspires something, I'm in the clear. Does that kind of make sense? But you can, at least with the law as it is right now, and it, it, lots of litigation still needs to happen because it's really hard to prove, right? But if I took one of these golden owls with red mechanical eyes and I gave it to a client as my own work, that's fraud. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So, but if I use it to make my own composite or my own version, or if I combine aspects of everything I like and make my own image, that's totally allowed. Yeah, the same kind of things we went over when compositing other people's pixels. But these are not other people's pixels. These are like mysterious act of God pixels. So M-A-O-G-P. Doesn't really spell anything. Mysterious act of God pixels. All right. Now, these are also now embedded into the software. So no one really has the option. And you will not, as a professional or even in your personal life, have the option of ignoring these kind of things. It's in Photoshop. It's in Illustrator. So it's good to know a little bit of how, how they work. And that's why I give you all these resources in these videos. I took my assignment one, my composite landscape, from last semester. And I just doubled its size. And then used, in Photoshop, they have a generative fill. And I don't demo it because I don't want you to use it for your assignments. But I played with it and it expanded the boundaries, right? And it did a pretty good job matching what I had set up in my original image, right? Now, I do own this image because Photoshop has coded it as a tool for the artist to use. And you can't just create it out of nothing, right? It has to be based on something that you already put in. But this has even made it, as of a couple of years ago, into our highest fine art institutions. So it, in MoMA, there's a great article, and you can see the YouTube video, and I've gotten to see this in person. There's this like three-story high digital animation projection that is on every moment that the museum is open, and it's all generative imaging based on data from the museum itself. And the artist owns it because they created all of the programming for it, right? And this was done before there was any litigation about like Dolly or, or Mid Journey or anything like that. And it's fascinating. And it's in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, right? It's one of his most popular exhibits. So the cat's out of the bag. How can we use it? So when we start this project, I told you to find photo reference for either your portrait or your animal that you're going to paint. And then I told you to find inspiration. And mine look like this, you know, for assignment seven. My photo reference, I'll make them a little bigger here. My photo reference here and here, and some of my inspirations, right? And then I set up in photo P, my PSD document at full resolution. And that resolution is, if you're setting yours up, just a blank one. 
of nine by